Okay, uh, welcome everybody to our sixth live lecture. Uh, tonight we have uh, <clears throat> Jim Dunlop, and he's going to be covering uh, completing system installation, which is uh, <clears throat> JTA topic domain number six, excuse me, number five. <clears throat> and uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jim Dunlop. Uh, he's the owner of Jim Dunlop Sol Solar. Uh, he's a leading expert in solar PV systems. He began his professional career at uh, Solar, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Florida Solar Energy Center, um, and uh, has developed curriculum on PV systems for the IBEW NECA National <clears throat> Electrical Apprenticeship Program. Um, he's been involved in the specification design, installation, and evaluation of hundreds of PV systems, and has authored and published numerous papers, articles, and reports, including <laughs> this guy right here, <laughs> which you guys all should know and love. This is the Bible of the solar PV industry, uh, training industry, um, truly excellent textbook. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Uh, it's all yours, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Um Good evening, everyone. Uh, just uh, Richard asked me to go over some of the some things with PV system testing and commissioning. Um, I think this has been uh, kind of a overlooked uh, area in a, in a lot of the installations lately, and, and something that uh, a lot of the folks are ramping up on in terms of the expectations of uh, you know test reports and, and things like that to verify. Uh, Safety, function, and performance, and uh, was working with a test equipment manufacturer in the UK that uh, actually wrote some things up. I derived this presentation from from that, and it talks a lot about the uh, the code issues. Um, I'll go through this PowerPoint. Hope everybody can see that. Okay, and um, essentially, um, you know, why is it important that we test and commission systems in a with an organized approach is that uh, you know many systems aren't being evaluated right now uh, satisfactorily. Few of them are being maintained uh, or tested over their life. That's, that's going to lead to unsafe, underperforming systems, uh, reduced value to the owners. And um, there's a lot of things that can be simply done. The inverters are going to do a lot of these tests uh, for us ultimately, uh, and some some tests already are being done by the inverters. So that's going to make things. Uh, a little bit easier from that perspective, but uh, there's still additional testing that can be done, and, and certainly to identify faults in the system and, and things of that nature when they when they happen. Um, uh, just going over an advanced organizer, just get our thinking going about you know the various components in the system, and obviously when we're talking about testing and measuring these things, we're talking about DC voltages, currents, AC voltages, and currents, powers. Uh, other types of uh, tests that we're going to do on these various circuits in the system. Um, one of the things that, that uh, kind of the basis for this system documentation and commissioning is this IEC 62446 standard. It's a uh, fairly new standard uh, developed by some guys in the UK that uh, require this for many of the incentive programs uh, in, in the UK and in, in Europe generally that, that these tests are done and the documentation is submitted in compliance with the standard. And it's uh, basically to verify safety, includes uh, insulation resistance testing, voltage and current verifications on strings and so forth, and uh, not really performance verification as much as just verifying functionality uh, in terms of the system and uh, voltages and so forth within 5% of, of nominal expectations at, at some steady sunlight temperature levels, that sort of thing. So, um, but recommend everyone get a hold of this standard eventually. This is kind of becoming commonplace expectation with, with larger projects, certainly. Um, the first thing that the standard addresses is the documentation um, aspects, which are really the whole key to safely and successfully, you know, commissioning and operating and maintaining a system. Um, and, you know, obviously details of all the design and components and, you know, documentation is so important for so many reasons for the uh, regulatory approvals with the building officials, utility interconnection, and as well as, you know, what the 
contractors are going to have to uh, go by as a guide when they're installing the equipment as well as something the owners and caretakers of that system are going to use to as a reference uh, over the life of that system. So very important to have good documentation that includes a lot of stuff. And, and this is kind of a, a, a checklist here. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but uh, obviously some, some general information about the DCAC power ratings, manufacturer model quantity of major components, uh, you know, contact information for everyone that's involved in the project or responsible parties, um, site layouts, single line diagrams, uh, annotations with all the types and sizes of ratings for all the balance system components, all your conductors, raceways, and overcurrent protection, disconnect means, uh, everything in the system that can need to be specified on, on, on that diagram. It, it may be needed in uh, more detailed engineering drawings uh, for commercial projects, obviously. But um, other things, all the specification sheets and, and manuals that, that are available for the modules, inverters, other major components, uh, mounting structures. Uh, a lot of that's going to include operation and maintenance, handling information for those products um, as well. That can be extracted out or referred to there. Um, something to deal with the operating procedures safety, maintenance plans, warranty details, all the testing reports, commissioning verification data, all that should be part of the documentation as well as any you know, financial details, permits, inspections, interconnection agreements, incentive program uh, type things that might be related to the project. The customer might want to have that all handy in one place. A lot of contractors work with them on that, so that's a good place to put it in one big book. So um, that's a kind of a summary of what's, you know, what the documentation aspects are. Now, as they get into the rest of that standard, um, they talk about a lot of the British uh, and the European, uh, the IEC electrical code, basically, the International Electrical Code. And, and uh, it's very similar to our electrical code, the NEC. Uh, this has different conventions for wire sizing, but most of the fundamental requirements for systems are the same uh, for PV systems as well. Um, this kind of an overview of what you know what our code covers uh, a lot of stuff in the first uh, four chapters as well as article 705 on the interconnection stuff now just a diagram on some of the circuits and components that uh, constitute the system the definition of the various circuits and, and so forth in the system we've got the PV source circuits output circuits inverter input circuits inverter output circuits these are all things that get verified and do the testing and commissioning in a system. So uh, one of the things that, that is striking about uh, the code requirements, there's a lot of things that, that you can do in, in validating NEC requirements for a system through a plan review and reviewing the design and, and then obviously a visual inspection of the installation. Uh, there's some things uh, that are NEC requirements that really can only be uh, validated through tests and measurements. And uh, a lot of these things aren't done for most PV installations, but probably should be. And, and that's kind of some of the things addressed in the standard. We're talking about the continuity, resistance or grounding, system of grounding electrodes, verifying, you know, voltage and currents, operation, short circuit, open circuit, that sort of thing. You know, recording those measurements and, you know, keeping those in the, in the permanent record for the system. Measure installation resistance, determine the integrity of the wiring systems that can be done on various circuits in the array as well. Um, and there's another reference here that I put, just the NFPA 70B, which is electrical equipment maintenance uh, recommended practice from, uh, from NFPA that um, talks about, uh, you know, plant maintenance on normal electrical systems, which a lot of the same kind of stuff applies to. To PV as well, and PV particularly is exposed to a lot of pretty harsh environmental conditions, and it's probably more imperative that we test PV systems routinely than we do regular building electrical systems. Um, one of the things we got to keep in mind with with all this is the electrical safety aspects, and a lot of a lot of talk about that lately, and a lot of ramp up with uh, OSHA compliance, and, and obviously, I think you know. People know if they're qualified or they're not, or they're working with people that are and learning from them. Um, should be familiar with the 
testing equipment, the measurements. Measurement and testing things is kind of a higher level than just installing stuff. You got to know kind of what to expect with the measurements and know what to do when something's not seems to be correct with the measurement and be able to verify or determine fault finding and get into the troubleshooting area. But uh, uh, you got a couple standards here. Obviously, the OSHA standards have to do with a lot of the uh, things in constructing and maintaining installations, the fall protection, the electrical hazards, and so forth. And and then you've got the standard for electrical safety in the workplace from NFTA 70E that uh, really covers a lot of details on how to recognize um, and, and address different workplace electrical hazards. And uh, part of the things in there uh, that are particularly important, I think, are determine the fall currents in these larger systems that uh, – you know, technically you can have fault currents of the entire array fall back to one combiner box, and that's why the disconnects and things, and making sure we can work on those in a de-energized state. Uh, otherwise, they're going to have a, a, a appreciable arc flash boundary associated with, with larger systems, and it's going to require a lot, you know, full arc flash suits and personal protective gear, and we've got to work on these things if, if you want to follow all the rules. So, um, you know, that's part of the engineering of the systems to try to make that a little bit less uh, significant in terms of uh, arc flash potential at those combiner boxes or, or any points in the DC system. So uh, commissioning uh, systems, I guess, there's there's several aspects to that, um, both in terms of the technical administrative details, but uh, as far as what you do, obviously you're completing all the final installation details, visual inspections, verifying compliance with NEC, conducting your verification tests, uh, verifying functionality, operation startup shutdown, safety emergency procedures. You're going to try to update any of the documentation as needed, drawings at as-built status, and any kind of training to the user on the orientation of the system, operation, safety, that sort of thing uh, could be done uh, as part of that commissioning. Um, so the first things you usually do are final installation, check out, you're, you're verifying all the structural electrical components properly installed, secured, um, everything's been installed in a neat workmanlike manner, wire management's all taken care of, uh, proper connections and terminations, everything's been labeled properly, including torque settings, all the tables for all the torques that you got to do on all the terminals have all been done where applicable, including with the documentation. Um, Verify all the any adjustments or settings, controllers, inverters, that kind of stuff. Mostly not for grid connected systems, but uh, verifying all disconnects are open, fuses removed, and lockout tagout procedures are in place. And then completing any other resolved items. This is all prior to operation uh, before beginning operation of the system for the first time. Um, Here's a little guideline uh, from download from IREC, Bill Brooks' document on field inspections. Kind of goes through some of the you know, checklists and so forth. Uh, organized kind of an approach to the you know uh, process there for both contractors and inspectors and so forth. So uh, you know, take a look at that. You can download that from the IREC website. Um, now, some of the things that can be uh, verified in those visual inspections, obviously, the 110 requirements, uh, obviously looking to see the equipment properly listed, labeled, identified, suitable for conditions of use, properly installed according with the listed instructions, all that stuff's uh, done properly in a neat, warm, and light manner, uh, it's mechanically secured, provided with adequate ventilation, cooling, especially for inverters, arrays, and so forth. Terminations made using approved products and methods, including torques, as I mentioned. Um, you've got equipment that's all marked properly with the manufacturer's labeling. Sufficient workspaces are allowed about all equipment. That's kind of a real problem with retrofits trying to jam an extra PV inverter or two into places that they probably don't fit. But uh, any of that stuff that has to be worked on energized has to have certain working clearances, and any electrical equipment has to be installed with certain space about it. So. Um, take a look at those requirements in 110.26. Um, obviously, all the stuff from Article 690 that, that we all know about, all the calculating circuit voltages and currents, determining the conductor over current device sizes and ratings, uh, you know, all these things need to be kind of verified, compliant with the design, hopefully. 
um, several sources of checklists I've listed down here from John Wiles' checklist on, on his website, uh, the one Bill put together for the field inspection documents listed here, as well as one on my website that uh, you can use kind of as a guide to go through and check off everything. Probably a good thing to study for a NAPSEP exam if some of you guys are sitting for that. Um, so on testing, now there's the uh, main thing I'm going to get into is the type of test that would be done. I'm not going to talk too much about interpreting the results here or troubleshooting. Um, Maybe that's uh, for, for Thursday night, I guess, Richard. But uh, the uh, any type of PV system needs to be tested, obviously, when it's commissioned and, and should be tested periodically over its lifetime. Um, you know, it's in addition to verifying performance from inverters and, and so forth. Um, these tests are important because they're baseline tests. And they give you uh, kind of a, a benchmark for subsequent tests and, and expectations that you know, you're going to have later on down the down the line, specifically for insulation resistance readings, it generally is going to decrease over time. Uh, but good to know what the baseline is so you have something to compare it against. Same thing with all the other electrical measurements in the system. Um, That's going to help you identify problems and track things down. You know, if you have a fault develop in a, in a source circuit, maybe no way to tell it. You know, without going and doing insulation resistance tests on that source circuit or looking how it's degraded over time. Um, so several types of tests that can be done to verify a lot of the code requirements. There's continuity resistance testing, you got to verify all the grounding bonding connections, terminations, ground resistance, clarity testing, as well as voltage current testing, you got to verify, you know, correct uh, phasing, clarity, and values for, you know, within the specifications for the system. And uh, installation resistance testing is going to verify the integrity of the wiring the equipment. Terminations and so forth um, can be used to detect faults in the system as well that, that we'll talk about here in a minute. And then there's performance verifications, the power, energy production, and so forth that uh, is obviously one of the first steps. And you know, if you see the performance is down, you usually start looking somewhere else to find out where you know where the electrical problems are. Um, Continuity testing, again, I've just listed some things here. I'm not going to get into too much detail with, with the, uh, you know, specific code requirements, but continuity testing used for a lot of stuff to verify, you know, proper bonding connections, uh, verify bonding of the grounding electrodes, uh, and, and proper connections to those grounding electrodes, verifying that all equipment, metal race plates, enclosures, equipment enclosures, all that kind of stuff is all uh, properly connected uh, continuously to the equipment grounding system. You've got uh, any kind of plug receptacle kind of connection, uh, you know, that can be verified through continuity testing, uh, tracking things down that uh, didn't, you know, cross wires, source circuits mixed up, things like that. Um, obviously, uh, the mod, you know, verifying all the equipment grounding again, that's in Article 310, 69043. Uh, more about the equipment grounding connections and bonding jumpers between modules, inverters, you know, if you remove for service, and then maintaining continuity of those connections across the entire support structure, which is obviously we're using a lot of different equipment and the special equipment bonding washers and stuff to, to make those connections. Uh, so um, here I see, Richard, we've got a question here from uh, from Bill. So the question was, uh, should you wait to do baseline testing on a clear day or simply measure the irradiance at the time of the test? <laughs> That's a good question. If you're trying to do it for performance verification purposes, it's probably a better way to clear day. But if you're just simply doing it uh, in accordance with this IEC standard, uh, it doesn't really matter what the irradiance is. It does need to be consistent, though. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be right at noon, but it, it should be at a fairly high level if you're going to try to compare with the specs. Uh, the, the IC standard just requires a, a plus or minus 5% of all the readings that you take have to be consistent. So you're supposed to do those under consistent irradiance and not do any corrections in the standard. But if you want to do the detailed you know, performance estimates, you'd have to, to do that. So I think that probably addresses that question. The uh, 
polarity testing, obviously that's done in conjunction with voltage testing. Verifying proper polarity module, source circuits, output circuits, disconnecting means, terminations, battery controller circuits, uh, inverter input terminations, all that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for voltage and current testing, we want to verify correct phasing at utility supply for three phase systems, the AC terminals and disconnects, electrical generators, verify DC voltage, <coughs> and polarity at the, uh, and all the DC circuits, as well as the, uh, any DC utilization equipment in the system. Hang on just one minute here. I'm going to put everybody on mute for just one second. Sorry, just had to clear my thread there a little bit. Um, now, insulation resistance testing, kind of interestingly enough, some of the newer inverters are doing this on startup every day, so that's going to make this job a little easier. But um, this basically involves verifying the integrity of the wiring systems by applying a high voltage across the, uh, the circuits to ground between conductors and verify either by measuring leakage current or by actually measuring the insulation resistance uh, with a mega ohm meter or special insulation resistance meter. And we're looking for obviously low value, something less than a mega ohm that would indicate some sort of fault in the system. Um, can also use this equipment to test the grounding electrodes in the, in the system as well. <coughs> a lot of uh, safety issues with the uh, insulation resistance tester. They put out high voltage, some of them, you know, several thousand volts, uh, depending on what your what kind of conductors you're testing. So you should be wearing gloves. Um, you always make sure circuits are de-energized with the exception of the array. Isolate all the circuits. Um, never use the insulation testing in, in explosive environments or uh, <laughs> don't ever test any uh, any circuits that have sensitive electronics in it or surge protection equipment or anything like that or batteries. Uh, make sure all circuits are discharged with any you know, capacitors or anything in there. Uh, or wiring system, the normal capacitance needs to be discharged, so wait a few minutes after you de-energize circuits before you conduct these tests. Um, here's an example of a uh, the Seaward Solar PV100 insulation test kit. This will do continuity tests, resistance tests. <laughs> It'll do insulation resistance tests. It'll store measurements um, and download them the uh, USB port and kind of give you all the stuff you need to produce this test report for the IEC standard. So you guys might want to take a look at that. The website's down there on the uh, seawardsolar.com. Read a little bit more about this, this piece of test equipment. You can also get fluke insulation resistance testers. You can use voltmeters and clamp on ammeters and other stuff to measure the other parameters. But this actually has all the equipment built in with the uh, clamp on DC AC ammeter, the test probes. It actually uh, short circuits the array that measures the, you know, puts high voltage across the array and into ground and measures the resistance that way. Um, some things on functional testing. Obviously, uh, we're, we're talking about energizing the system at this point. Um, and, and going through some operational checks, these are some very simple things that are based on uh, 69061 requirements. Uh, these are all tests that can be verified to demonstrate the functionality of those performance of the anti-ioning provisions in the inverters. Um, on the performance testing, uh, you know, verifying the power output, energy production, IV measurements. These are more uh, certainly the IV measurements, more advanced kinds of things that might be done to 
you know, look at some problems within modules or something uh, in, in a system. But uh, certainly, we're all doing the AC power and AC energy verification on the on the inverters, so no need to talk a lot about about that. Some of the things ID measurements can do for you, and I guess Seaward's coming out with a unit. Soul Soulmetric makes one. Um, help you determine whether you're uh, tracking max power properly. Uh, it's not certain that all inverters are doing that great a job with that. They may operate at 97% efficiency, but uh, if they don't track maximum power, that's a 90%. That's uh, the efficiency doesn't mean much. <laughs> determine power voltage degradation. Compare with uh, manufacturer's rating. Um, you're going to see shading effects. You're going to see faults in modules uh, in, in the IV curve, bumps in the IV curve, things like that. Uh, you're going to be able to look for uh, maybe bypass diode problems if you have a can do reverse uh, reverse bias testing on on the IV curve to, to determine that. So a lot of things you can tell with IV curves you can't tell with regular just voltage current measurement. A lot of other tests uh, might be done as well. Uh, Power quality analysis, looking at uh, interconnection issues, maybe inverters are dropping offline. You got to look and see what the problems are. You have to look at the AC signal and see what what's going on there. Uh, a lot of guys are doing thermal imaging um, on arrays. Uh, obviously, inverter cooling, any wiring connections, terminations, junction boxes, combiner boxes. Um, can easily detect problems uh, that, that you wouldn't be able to tell visually. Um, you can do inverter efficiency test, shading analysis, obviously, that we all know about. Um, so just to kind of summarize, and we'll take any other questions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different electrical tests that can be conducted on PV systems. Um, that will verify functionality, safety, compliance with the electrical codes and standards. So one of the things that I'm most uh, impressed about in going through this exercise is, is how many of the code requirements can be verified through electrical tests and measurements uh, as opposed to just you know visual inspections. Um, so I think there's real opportunity for installation service contractors uh, to offer you know these value-added services either part of the contract or service contracts. Uh, I think to, to be able to do these kinds of things for a customer is going to probably get people more business uh, when they can check things a little bit more carefully uh, and, uh, you know, have a regular periodic testing and maintenance program, probably some, some you know, revenue there to be produced as well. Um, and, and I think this is all ultimately going to help, help optimize performance and, and it really gives you the tools you need to troubleshoot, diagnose, and remedy problems in the system if you're able to make tests and, and interpret the measurements, kind of know what you're expecting to measure and then be able to determine, verify that or verify something else and determine what the cause of the problem might be. Um, as I mentioned, there's, you've got custom test equipment out there in the industry that to do, do many of these tests in one unit as opposed to having to have four or five different meters. Uh, the one good thing is uh, that a lot of these newer inverters are going to be able to do a lot of these tests uh, and record this data automatically. Uh, still, there's that issue if you have a ground fault in a fairly large array, if you don't have string level monitoring, it's going to be very, very difficult to find it without being able to go through and do installation resistance testing. Uh, it's not going to be something you visually can see. It'll be almost impossible to determine which, which circuit it is without doing those kinds of tests. So. Uh, Anyway, that kind of concludes the presentation that I have. Well, I guess we'll Richard will open it up to some questions if anybody has anything here, and, and here's my uh, my contact information. Any questions? Uh, Jim, do you see the uh, the the chat message there from Mike Riley? Yeah. I'm asking, uh, do most okay. inverters have maximum, maximum power point tracking? Right, that's true, Mike, and, and uh, essentially, uh, but it's not certain that, that they all do a very good job of that. That's not necessarily reflect. That's not reflected in the efficiency of the inverter. That's kind of a separate uh, factor that's not really reported, uh, although most report and most probably do a pretty good job of it. There's, there's probably 
some products out there, and that's one of the uh, one of the topics that Sandy and Florida Solar Energy Center and some of the other test labs are actually monitoring right now to determine you know when you have rapidly changing sunlight conditions like we do in Florida, you know sometimes these inverters can get lost in maximum power point tracking. They may not respond immediately. It may take a minute or two for them to get back. You know, tracking max power uh, as accurately as they they should to to harvest the maximum energy out of the array. So, uh, yeah, they, all the inverters have maximum power point tracking circuits in them. At least the interactive inverters that couple directly to arrays, and uh, certainly you know that's that's something that can be additionally verified through these tests. How are we doing, Richard? We got any participants left? Hey. So, yes, sir. I just sent you another chat from uh, William Swan. Uh, he's okay. asking if you have any comments with respect to the use of microinverters. Uh, sure. I think there's, uh, you know, I think they're becoming really popular. Certainly, smaller stuff, uh, non-homogeneous arrays. You know, modules in different orientations or partially shaded uh, thermal gradients in the array, obviously, uh, and then the monitoring level that you get from uh, from those, and, and obviously using lower voltage arrays, there's a lot of advantages. It's going to be tough for them to compete with the, the 50 kilowatt and up market just due to the, the cost, but, uh, you know, and the, and the difficulty in individual inverter replacement at that, that level, but uh, certainly I think there's some advantages in smaller installations. Uh, some people love them, some people uh, would rather use string inverters, but I, I do think they provide a lot of good data, certainly. So we got from Michelle Roberts here. Um, okay, she's just asking for the PowerPoint, Richard. I think she'll be able to look at, uh, she'll be able to look at uh, the entire webinar, right? <clears throat> yes, that's correct. We'll uh, uh, download this webinar session and then uh, uh, send it out as part of the newsletter tonight, so everyone will have access to the to the full recording. Okay, Richard, did that satisfactorily answer your question on the PowerPoint tracking and when did it become commercially viable? Um, I guess it's always been a part of the interactive inverters. The, the first, it, it's really a DC to DC converter. I guess if that helps answer that any any better. And there's a few of those used early on. That it, it, it's a you know linear current boosters were the first form of maximum power point trackers, if you will. You know, just a, a way to operate the array at a fixed voltage. Usually, the array max powers at a pretty constant voltage throughout the day, even through temperature changes. Um, due to the fact the you know voltage goes up a little bit with increasing sunlight, but it comes down with increasing temperature, you know, at high radiance levels on the array. So I think that's kind of works in its favor. So most of these things kind of you know operate around you know seeking back and forth you know around a, a pretty constant voltage uh, on any given day for a particular site, and then try to continually uh, you know seek a, a, a larger power output by Shifting the load one way or the other, so. Uh, but I think at least 20, 25 years, power trackers have been around. I mean, Mike's got a uh, Mike Riley's got a question here. Uh, is it accurate to measure modules maximum voltage off record low temperature? Um, yeah, that's a good question, Mike. I think that the uh, the clarification in the 2011 NEC was that uh, the informational note there suggests uh, using the ASHRAE 2% uh, minimum design temperatures, which are a little less uh, severe than the record lows. We never really do reach maximum voltage on the arrays at zero sunlight when you have these record low temperatures. Um, you don't get maximum voltage on PV arrays until you get Couple hundred watts per square meter. And by that time, it's well the ambient's well above record low, and the modules are as well. So, uh, I think what what was done in the 2011 code, you know, provided those numbers. If you go to um, 
I think it's on the IREC site or Solar ABC site, uh, Solar America Board for Codes and Standards has a document that Bill Brooks put together that has the uh, has published 2% uh, minimum design temperatures for a whole bunch of major U.S. cities uh, that I think could be used as a, 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 a more reasonable number for determining that uh, that maximum voltage, and I think that's going to give you uh, a lot more wiggle room on the on the lower end in terms of you know having high enough voltage when the thing's hot. So that's uh, I think we can come down a little bit on the high end. Plus, my, the arrays are going to degrade voltage, going to degrade half a percent to a percent every year anyway, naturally. So I think a lot of what's in the code was pretty conservative for safety purposes, but I think it was recognized it was a little too stringent of a requirement uh, to base it on the record low. So they said if you look at the language now, it's it's uh, lowest expected ambient temperature and then read the informational note, and I think that will clear it up for you. And go to the Solar ABC site and get that document. Okay, we've got another uh, questions about some basic tracking versus static arrays, um, from William. Um, I guess that's uh, – I guess you just really need to look at the uh, solar radiation data and determine, you know, what kind of advantage you're getting. I don't think two-axis tracking is usually justifiable. Single axis may be. But I always say you got to look at the cost of your uh, – how much more is your support structure cost? If you're getting 20% enhancement, that's going to – you know, you're saving 20% on the size of your array or saving 20% buying 20% less modules. So figure out what that costs. If the uh, additional cost for a movable tracker and the foundation work and all that kind of stuff is is comparable or less, then you, you probably have a good deal. Um, I think certainly, you know, Single axis may be justifiable if the tracking maintenance and cost of the tracker are cheap enough, but you got to compare it against a fixed system. If you've already got a roof or something and you just have to fold up some rails and stuff, it's probably going to be probably not going to make much sense to put a tracker in somebody's backyard to get another 15, 20 percent out of it when you already got a good mounting surface on the roof. So it's application dependent. Certainly, pumping systems and Direct coupled applications like that could really benefit a lot more from tracking than just uh, installation enhancements. So Richard had a question here on uh, inverter warranties versus uh, silicon panels. Well, there's we got silicon PV modules around where I live. They've been up for 25, 30 years and seem to still be putting out. 80% or more of the rate of power, so I think silicon's pretty well proven the test of time. It's more in the packaging, the laminates, uh, I guess, and uh, you think we'll ever have inverter warranties that match the panels. Uh, I don't know. Probably not. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, William had another question here on the in inverter fault diagnostics. Uh, yeah, I think that's getting more sophisticated all the time, William. Some companies I know just have IT guys that do nothing but uh, deal with the inverter communications and data analysis and dispatch service guys to, you know, go troubleshoot specific parts of systems based on the data and their interpretation of the data. Uh, I think we're seeing, you know, larger systems with combiner level, string level monitoring, fault diagnostics. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff that the inverters are going to do for us automatically. So. That should that should help uh, help the problem somewhat of not having to do as many customized tests. But obviously, it's important for everybody to know about these individual tests. You may wind up having to do these things to verify some things that the inverter might or might not be telling you at some point in the future. Uh, Jeremy had a question here about an east and west orientation. Uh, depends on kind of the latitude, Jeremy. Uh, you know, if you're in the southern part of the U.S., it works pretty good. I actually have my array on a uh, little array on an east and west part of my house because my southern exposure was shaded when I originally put an array up. So I've got, but those are two separate 
strings, I guess, that are um, located on those different surfaces. So they uh, they don't put out the same amount of current, but they're connected in parallel. And essentially, you know, more or less average the voltages, I guess, at that point. And uh, so if it's all you got, it's it's not that bad. But I would run, uh, Jeremy, I would go ahead and run PV watts uh, and, and determine the insulation that you get on the west orientation, the east, superimpose the results compared to what you get on the west. I think you can answer your own question for yourself there if you just run the uh, run a quick simulation with PV watts online. Okay, uh, you guys are looking at some left field questions that might be on the NASF exam. Um, I don't think they're trying to trick you or anything. Uh, I can tell you, uh, you probably need to read John Wiles' document on PV systems and the National Electrical Code. It's got a lot of great examples in there, problems that are worked out. And uh, you'll see a lot of those kinds of questions on the exam. So go to his website. I've got it listed in my presentation here, I believe. So um, go there, go through his book, go through the annexes in his PV systems and National Electrical Code document. A lot of good problems in there. Okay, Sam had a question here that uh, two strings of different number of modules in series to string inverters, all modules are the same kind. Uh, probably don't really want to do that. I mean, you want to have match the voltage, Sam, uh, as close as you can, same number of cells, modules, and series. Um, uh, if you're going to be putting these things in parallel at the combiner box to the to the string inverter, uh, sounds like an application for the microinverter or just drop a couple modules off of that string that's, that, that's heavy. That's, that's not going to be optimal for you in that configuration. Um, Brian had a question here. Baseline data typically provided with system documentation of customer contract performance. Well, the customer is mainly going to be looking at AC energy production and maybe peak AC power output during the day at some point. Uh, certainly the installation contractors need to give an expectation of that and most importantly, that, that that AC output is going to be something like 75% of the DC power rating of the array, even at full sun due to temperature and other losses in the system, so inverter efficiency and whatnot. So uh, I think it's important for the customer to have a clear expectation of, of what to look at. I've had people call me and said somebody said they put a 10-kilowatt system in, and the maximum I've seen seven and a half kilowatts AC output. And I said, well, that's what you should expect, you know, and, and you know, they get all disturbed that they were misled uh, or something because they got a DC rating in the in the sales pitch. So, you know, make sure that's clear. Um, obviously, the, the the external monitoring stuff, the wireless stuff, the Bluetooth stuff, the USB type monitors, all that stuff's great to give the customer. They need to be able to verify that the thing's producing energy. Or, like I said earlier, the better contractors are monitoring this stuff for their customers and letting their customers know when there's a problem. So, uh, you know, however you want to deal with that, but that's uh, very important. That's going to be your first indication that something's going awry if the performance is uh, is falling off. So, I think I've been keeping up with the questions, uh, Richard. Looks like we've got another one from Sam. Yeah, that's... Uh, Module voltage is going to uh, decrease with increasing temperature. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty standard temperature coefficients for crystalline are about four tenths of a percent per degree C. So uh, that's going to be reflected in most of the string sizing algorithms you use and the temperature corrections that you make uh, in accordance with uh, Article 690.7. Uh, Ryan asked about as-built versus uh, original documentation. I mean, it depends on whether you're the one that's going to be doing the, the markups or, you know, who, I guess, if it's just a, a, a foreman-level guy in the field, he's just going to mark it up with red pen and give it back to the engineers, uh, I would imagine, how that's going to be done, typically. <coughs> Sam, you got 
Sam, I guess your question, uh, yeah, voltage is going to decrease with increasing temperature. So that's a really important one for the NAVSEP guys. You are going to have temperature correction problems on that test, I can assure you. So make sure you know how to do that. It's very simple to think about it. You know, if it's negative four tenths of a percent per degree C, you basically, you go up 10 degrees C in temperature, your voltage decreases by two and a half percent. Or, or, or four percent, I'm sorry. Four percent for every 10 degrees C. So just think of it in terms of what's actually happen, happening, um, you know, with the percentage. It's a negative coefficient. The voltage is going down with increasing temperature. Uh, a lot of people have problems understanding it. I always tell them, well, if you make if you're making a hundred dollars a day and somebody gave you a ten percent raise, I'm sure you could figure out how much more money you'd make. So it's no different than determining you're either going to be operating at a higher or lower voltage depending on how much the temperatures change. So same same problem. Uh, let's see, Ryan. Total solar resource fraction. Uh, Ryan, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the question there, I think that may uh, you're talking about the the amount of solar radiation you have after shading analysis has been done or something to that effect. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe you can clarify the question. Uh, William has some questions about some of the long-term electrical failures that, that we've experienced in PV systems and you know, I think we're going to see more module problems coming up. We've seen a lot in the past. Uh, now that the manufacturers are trying to throughput and drive prices down, the cells are so thin nowadays uh, compared to what they were a few years ago. Um, there's going to be a lot more faults and quality control problems, particularly in some of the imported products that, you know, we'll just uh, you have to wait and see what happens. Uh, there's going to be burn throughs. There's going to be, you know, bad solder bond connections in modules. There's going to be hot spots. And this is why thermal imaging is going to be a big business for somebody to get out there and do that on arrays and find problems like this because there are going to be problems. I think wire management issues are being addressed in the code. That's been a big problem. A lot of guys installing these things that don't do proper set connections and terminations or wire management. Uh, those have been, uh, you know, a lot of the problems. Um, don't see as many inverter failures as we used to, but uh, that's certainly improved a lot. And, and but I think just in the general quality of the installation and being able to maintain these things over, you know, uh, 20, 30 year lifetime it, it exposed to the elements like they are, you know, it's not like this electrical equipment's installed inside or anything. This stuff's, you know, sitting outside most of it, at least the array is, and exposed to some pretty harsh conditions in a lot of places. So that's uh, that's why we need to look at these things a little more closely than, than maybe what we have uh So uh, Bill's asking about wire gauge for installations. I think, Bill, you just got to look at it based on, you know, your intensity requirement and then look at voltage drop issues and see if you can keep it below 2%. Yeah, you know, a lot of guys are having to upsize wires at combiner boxes if there's a long way down to inverters and stuff, even bigger than the module uh, wire size just to minimize voltage drop. So it's just a, a calculation you need to be able to do, just those law and determine the length of wire and the resistance of the cable per thousand feet and determine how much round trip distance you can have. Now there will be NASCAP questions on voltage drop probably. Make sure you do the round trip distance if they tell you it's 350 feet between a battery and a PV module and calculate the voltage drop at a certain current flow. Um, recognize that that current isn't flowing 350 feet and falling out on the ground at the, at the battery. The electrons aren't just falling out on the ground. They're, circulating in that wire back to the source, so you got to use the round trip distance to calculate voltage drop. A lot of people miss that, I think. Um, yeah, William was asking more about inverters. I, you know, that's, like I say, that, that's something that's going to evolve over time. Certainly the electronics are getting a lot better, better packaging. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of got to do with how it's treated when it's installed. If it's got proper cooling and it's, you know, it's not exposed to the elements, it's certainly going to last longer. Uh, it's kind of like how you treat your stereo, you know, is how you want to treat your inverter, really. Uh, it's a 
decide to go outside, I wouldn't put it in the rain or direct, direct sunlight. And uh, Sam's asking about recycling. Yeah, there's most of the major manufacturers all have recycling programs for their modules. Uh, so that's something I think we'll see a lot more of. There's a lot of valuable materials in there. In addition to the aluminum, they can recycle some of the silicon. I don't know about the encapsulate materials, but uh, they're already doing it. Check check with Solar World. I know they have a pretty robust uh, recycling program. They'll tell you about the whole deal. So how are we doing, Richard? Still there? Hi, right, Jim. Uh, yeah, it's going good. Uh, maybe we'll just give it a few more minutes, see if any other questions materialize. And if not, we'll, uh, we'll shut it down. Okay. Oh, here's another question from Sam. Yeah, we'll probably... Uh, Probably by this fall, late summer, that third edition will be out. I, I, I don't know the exact date or anything, but it's being worked on right now, Sam. So should be out by then for the fall semester at least, I guess. We have another question here. Um, yeah, stuff gets uh, struck by lightning all the time, Richard. Um, or was it? No, it was William as I said, I guess. Um, yeah, stuff gets struck by lightning all the time, and, and uh, not just TV systems, but you know, there's, there's nothing that attracts lightning to TV systems any more than it's, uh, you know, sharks are attracted to surfers, or lightning is attracted to golfers. So, uh, just you know, if you have arrays that are elevated in high areas, they, they have to be properly, you know, grounded and bonded. And if there's a lightning protection system on the building, um, that TV uh, equipment has to be bonded to that lightning protection system properly in accordance with those standards. So you're usually going to have to get a, a professional lighting protection expert involved to come in and do those uh, assessments of, of what has to be done on commercial installations that have lighting protection systems on them already. Uh, Yeah, I think Ryan's question about the JTA, yeah, the maintenance uh, commissioning inspection topics that we've been talking about certainly are, are part of the, uh, the NAPSEP job task analysis, uh, you know, very, very important part of that, I think. And then Mike Riley has a voltage drop calculation percentage drop. Twice the distance, resistance per thousand foot times the, uh, let's see, well, it's just going to be the uh, the current times the resistance. So that would be the, uh, you got to get the current in there somewhere. It looks like the uh, last term you need is the the current there. Looks like it says voltage, but I'm, I may not be reading that right. So just uh, voltage drop is equal to the current times the resistance. You figure out what the operating current is. You probably use the max power current instead of the uh, short circuit current for that. And uh, then just divide whatever that voltage drop comes to, whatever that voltage comes to times the current times the resistance times the resistance per unit length. Just go ahead and, uh, you know, divide that uh, by, the, uh, by the total circuit, you know, voltage. Uh, if it's, you know, whatever that typical operating voltage for the, you know, for the array might be if you're looking at the DC source circuits and you can determine that. Generally, it's 2% two, two or so is good to, good to achieve. You can you know, be able to get that if you don't have too long a ways to go. You just pop up the wire size. If, uh, but obviously, you get into more copper, you're talking about greater expense. And so there's a kind of a trade-off there in terms of what you want to what you want to try to achieve, but you know, a two percent voltage drop meaning two percent of your solar power is getting thrown out the window, getting burned up as heat in the wire. So you you know, be your own judge. There's no code requirement for keeping the voltage drop at any 
level, but there will be an abset question that will ask you to give you some circuit and say, okay, what do you got? What size wire you got to do to, you know, have the voltage drop below this, you know, this level, certain percentage or something. You have to go figure out, pick a wire, and, uh, you know, determine uh, what its resistance is from table, I think it's chapter 8, table 9, or something like that, or chapter 9, table 8. And the NEC is going to give you those insulation resistance or the uh, conductor resistance values that you'll need for that calculation. Hey, Jim, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, do you think you could uh, navigate to your website, Jim Dunlop Solar, and uh, show the participants uh, some of the uh, 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 things that you have uh, that can can potentially help them. Uh, your the book that you uh, you have photovoltaic systems plus uh, some of the uh, the other uh, uh, kits that you have for training. I think that would be uh, yeah. I mean, I, there's not a whole lot there, but I'll I'll be happy to do that. Let me uh, let me see where let me see where we are here now with. Uh, I guess I'm still sharing this PowerPoint application. Let me do this and see if I can get it. I'll try taking back uh, uh, control as the presenter, and uh, and then give you control once again as presenter, and that way you can select your uh, your. I don't know if that came up or so. not. You anything on there now? Actually, no. Now at this point, if you do share my desktop, um, it, okay, I got it. Now. Show up. Yeah. I got it. Now. Okay, you should see it now. Uh, yes, Jim, we see we see the website. Okay, so that's this just my main page, and uh, as uh, was mentioned, I'm the author of the Photovoltaic Systems textbook here on the on the left, and I published some training resources for instructors, a bunch of PowerPoint stuff and instructor notes that goes along with that uh, textbook and the same chapters and so forth. Uh, I'm going to be updating, as I mentioned, the book as well as the, the resource guide here this year. Um, I don't have a lot else going on on the website here other than there's some resources, some things, maybe a couple checklists down here, just some uh, publications, some presentations. Uh, Oh, it's got to do with licensing. I don't think anybody would be interested in that. There is a code checklist on here somewhere. This is based on 2008 code. It's not updated for 2011 yet, but most of the requirements are in there. So you can take a look at that. That's probably the only thing. What else I got here? It's, uh, a couple other. Recommended documents here. Some of the most of the stuff I've got on here, reference-wise, is most of the maps have recommended references anyway. So uh, when I'm doing training, I'll have things advertised or notices on on the website here. Mostly I'm training for you know private clients and stuff and electrical distributors. And occasionally I'll host classes of my own, but uh, anyway, that's. Uh, so you guys can find out about, more about me if you register. You know, I won't bug you or anything, but when I have training or something offered or new stuff available, I'll send you an email. Okay, let's see. We got another question from Mike, I think, here on uh, there's that here. Uh, magnetic declination or finding true south. Um, yeah, here's the easiest way to remember, Mike. It's just the opposite. If you're in the eastern part of the United States, you got west declination. The, the compass needle is going to point west of true geographic north. On the in, the in the western United States, you got east declination. The compass needle is going to point east of 
true geographic north. <clears throat> so if they give you what the magnetic declination is, and if it's negative, okay, it's westerly. If it's positive, it's easterly. Um, that's the simplest way to remember it. They may ask you to adjust that, or it's really insignificant. I don't know why they'd really want to ask you a question on that, because even if you're 15 degrees magnetic declination, that's not going to affect orientation of arrays is not going to be affected by 15 degrees azimuth significantly. <laughs> Just in terms of the time of day production. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just, just realize that whatever part of the country you're in, you're on the left coast, it's it's east declination. If you're on the east coast, it's west declination. Hey, Rick, all right, Jim. Another application there. We're all good. And uh, just let people know they can email me or whatever. We can address any other questions that come up later. And once okay. Call tomorrow, we'll do. tomorrow morning, we'll talk about Thursday. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate it. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll have this up in the uh, uh, daily newsletter as a video recording. Uh, if you didn't catch the beginning of this, it'll be av available uh, later tonight. Uh, once again, thank okay. you, Jim. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. Take care. Signing off.